Hi, and welcome to this course in digital painting. Actually, let me rephrase that and frame it a little differently. This is a course on painting using a digital medium. I like that better. After all, much like working with charcoal, pastels, watercolor, or oil paint, digital is ultimately just another set of tools at our disposal. However, it certainly is a special tool with a wide range of capabilities. Don't let it intimidate you though. We'll be exploring in depth the great power this relatively young medium has to offer. Whether you're an amateur or an expert, this course was designed for you. Perhaps that seems like a bold statement, but I believe strongly that artists of all levels benefit from in-depth study and repeated exercise of the fundamental principles of painting. That's why I'm so excited to share the experience of this course with you. I've been painting professionally for over 10 years now, and I know that through this course, I will further expand my own knowledge and refine my abilities as we explore this great medium in depth. In the process, it's my goal to amplify and share the excitement with you. Throughout these lessons, I'll be sharing with you examples from great artists, from both the past and present. Together, we'll observe how they utilize the fundamentals to achieve such inspiring work. We'll analyze within context how these essential techniques and concepts can be applied to great effect. You'll see that the fundamentals aren't just for beginners. In fact, I think you'll discover that what sets great artists apart from the crowd is their unique familiarity and grasp of fundamental concepts. It could be that the effective study and practice of fundamentals is also why some young artists seem to improve so rapidly, while many other students seem to make little progress. I'm sure we've all known passionate artists out there who weren't like mad, but with little progress to show for it. We'll all find ourselves in that situation from time to time. The good news is, the path out of that mire is always within reach. We simply need to humble ourselves and return to the fundamentals. Just as the master pianist must practice his scales, just as the Olympic athlete must run their daily drills, we artists must routinely reacquaint ourselves with the fundamentals of image making. That's the great aim of this course. The next eight weeks will begin with the basics and gradually introduce more advanced concepts. Week one will begin with a quick introduction to the medium itself, along with the various tools at our disposal. We'll explore the anatomy of light and shadow and study the simple beauty of primitive forms. In week two, we'll be diving into surface materials, color, and texture. We'll explore the fascinating ways in which different materials reflect light and how to capture that broad range of effects in our work. In week three, we'll paint directly from observation. To do that effectively, we'll need to be able to simplify the great complexity of the world. With careful value and edge control, we'll explore how to make paintings with clear focus and strong impact. During week four, we'll explore the surprising advantages of working with self-imposed limitations. You'll see how constraints can transform the way you approach an image and generate unique and appealing styles. Week five is all about standing on the shoulders of giants. We will study master artists from both past and present so that we can absorb some of their hard-won knowledge and continue to pass the torch forward. In week six, we'll focus on optimizing our painting process for faster results with greater impact. In week seven, we'll explore the great versatility of digital painting with efficient techniques for concept art and illustration work. Finally, in week eight, I will introduce you to a variety of more advanced painting techniques that may become powerful tools for taking your work to the next level. And with that, let's get started. There are many exciting topics to cover. All right, let's begin with a quick overview of digital painting tools. One of the great advantages of digital art is just how accessible it is. All you need is a computer, a painting app of some sort, and a stylus to draw with. While the upfront cost of good technology might seem high, it's actually quite low in the long run, especially compared to the reoccurring expense of 
Things like traditional paints, brushes, paper, and canvas. Not only that, but digital art requires very little studio space. You can do everything at a comfortable desk and you don't need a huge closet to store all your drawings and painted studies. As with any craft, however, if we're serious about digital art, then it's a good idea to create an ideal working environment, complete with the best tools for the job. Having a comfortable and ergonomic workstation for your digital art should be a very high priority. I want to emphasize this right here at the beginning of the course because I feel it's so important and yet often overlooked. If you're trying to create art while sitting in a chair that gives you back pain or a sharp desktop corner that rubs your arm with every stroke of the pen, that discomfort is going to show in your work. Maybe you have limited space to work with, but I implore you to make the most of it. If you can upgrade your chair and desk, do it. I use a desk that can be raised and lowered with a crank so that I can periodically switch back and forth from a standing and sitting position. I bought this after a period of intense back pain and it has since relieved me of that problem. Perhaps the most frustrating thing for a digital artist is a slow or unreliable computer. If your computer is sluggish or crashes frequently, it's time for an upgrade. Painting apps like Photoshop don't require the greatest technology, but you'll probably want at least a mid-range computer to avoid brush lag or sluggish save and load times. While a few seconds delay here and there may not seem like much of an issue, it all adds up over time. More than anything, a slow computer leads to frustration. We don't want to be constantly distracted by technical issues while we're trying to create great work. So take this as permission to invest in a new computer if your current contraption is grinding its gears and yours. Also, just make sure that your workspace is always ready and accessible. The easier it is to sit down and start painting, the less resistance you'll encounter when doing it. This course will be taught using Adobe Photoshop, and that's where I've spent the majority of my time. However, there are now more alternative painting apps than ever before. I encourage you to try a variety of them before you settle down. And of course, I have to mention that there are also alternatives to working at a desktop computer now, most notably Apple iPad Pro paired with the Apple Pencil is an incredible drawing tool. I've enjoyed working in Procreate on the iPad, especially for studies and sketches. To me, it's like the perfect middle ground between drawing in a sketchbook and working in Photoshop. More and more artists are gravitating in this direction now, partly because it's so mobile and requires even less workspace or investment than a desktop computer. Having said that, I still personally prefer to do any serious painting at my desk. I work faster and with more comfort in Photoshop, especially for long hours. While many artists prefer drawing on screen tablets, I like to use the Wacom Intuos Pro and Stylus. I actually consider it an advantage to not have my drawing arm between me and the screen. It allows me to see the whole image at all times, and I can sit more comfortably without hunching over a screen. By the way, I place my tablet on a thin wooden board and I prop that board against the edge of my raised monitor stand. This provides a comfortable tilt, very much like a drafting table. One of my favorite tools is my Razer GamePad. While this is designed for gaming, I only use it for painting. I have bound all my most used Photoshop shortcuts to the programmable keys. It allows my fingers to reach everything without moving my hand. This sits comfortably to the left side of my Wacom tablet. Lastly, in terms of hardware, make sure you have at least one quality monitor screen. If your old monitor is dim or has a green tinge to it, that's going to disturb your color perception. 
It's worth investing in a quality screen with good color accuracy. If possible, get two. It's a great idea to have a secondary monitor for displaying reference while you work. All right, so before we dive into painting, I just want to provide a quick Adobe Photoshop crash course. For now, I will only focus on the most essential features of the interface and the tools relevant to painting. Photoshop, as the name implies, is fundamentally designed as a powerful photo editing tool. The vast majority of Photoshop users don't paint with it, and yet, Despite not being designed with artists like us as the priority, the interface and the tools are excellent for digital drawing and painting. While the brush engine may not have as many features as more dedicated painting apps, it is incredibly versatile. Professional artists of all sorts often prefer Photoshop over alternatives, largely because it has so many advanced manipulation tools. You can start and finish images all in one place, while other apps aiming to reduce complexity often lack the tools necessary for fine-tuning an image. However, if you'd rather work with a different painting app, that's totally fine. There are many great alternatives now. Ultimately, it's best to use whatever app you enjoy most. The fundamentals of painting that we discuss will be just as applicable no matter which tool you choose. Now let's jump in. Um, setting up a new digital canvas is easy. For many professional assignments, you'll be provided with specific image scale and resolution requirements. For personal work, I generally don't worry too much about the specific pixel dimensions. I can always expand or crop my canvas later in the process. However, as a general rule, I like to start with a, a medium resolution canvas. For example, anything from 3,000 to 5,000 pixels on each side is pretty comfortable. If you work much lower than that, you might have issues with pixelation. If you work much higher, the file size will likely begin to hinder Photoshop's performance. If you have an older, slower computer, you may find that you need to work smaller in order to avoid sluggishness as you paint. If your computer rig is a cutting edge beast, you'll likely be fine with larger resolutions. The resolution setting is a common point of confusion. It's often referred to as DPI, dots per inch, or PPI, pixels per inch, although technically these are two different things. You'll only need to concern yourself with this setting if you're planning to print your image, in which case, 300 dpi is the standard for quality prints. When we're setting the pixel dimensions directly, rather than inches or centimeters, the pixels per inch is not a factor. Therefore, I generally input my desired pixel height and width, leaving the resolution at the default setting. The presentation of Photoshop's interface is fairly standard largely because Photoshop set the standard. Again, I won't try to cover every feature at the moment. I'm just going to focus on the essentials. Photoshop allows you to rearrange all the major panels. So if your workspace looks different than mine, that's okay. I would just make sure to close any panels that you don't need on the screen so that you have a clean and uncluttered workspace. Some artists like to group all their panels and windows together at one side of the screen, but I find that this layout works well for me. You can save your workspace arrangement using the button at the top right corner of the interface. The slim panel on the left side of the screen is the toolbar. All of these have uses, but primarily we'll be using the brush tool. The shortcut key for the brush tool is B on your keyboard. I rarely click on the actual interface button. It's far faster and more efficient to use the shortcut key. In combination with the brush tool, you'll definitely want to keep the eraser, shortcut E, handy. It's not just for correcting mistakes. 
we'll also use it to refine our brush strokes. While painting, you'll frequently want to select colors that you've already placed on the canvas. The fastest way to do this is to toggle the eyedropper tool, also known as the color picker, by holding down Alt or Option on the Mac. At the very top of the panel is the Move tool, Hotkey V, which you'll use to move elements around on your canvas. And just below that are two variations of the Marquee Selection tools. Uh, the first is for rectangular selections, Hotkey M, while the second allows for freehand selection, Hotkey L. One of the great advantages of digital painting is the ability to reposition elements that are already on the canvas. These tools make that possible. The other essential tool for the moment is the hand tool, hotkey H. However, don't use this button or a shortcut key for it. Instead, simply hold the space bar on your keyboard to toggle this on temporarily. You'll be using this feature constantly to pan your canvas and move it around on screen, so it's important to do it quickly. In combination with the pan tool, you'll want to be able to quickly zoom in and out of your image. I use the scroll wheel on my gamepad and mouse for that. However, you can also zoom in and out by holding space plus alt at the same time, and then scrub your stylus from side to side. This is commonly referred to as the scrubby zoom feature. So there's a ton of panels and windows in Photoshop. You can access and open all of them from the window tab at the top. But the only two that I have open at all times are the layer panel and the color window. As you can see, I actually use a plugin for my color panel called Colorus, which you can find online by searching for that name. I just prefer it over the default window because it has a more compact interface and a few more features. The other two panels that I use frequently are the brush window and the brush settings window, which are both nestled as small buttons next to the layers window. Some artists like to arrange these so that they are visible at all times, but I prefer an open workspace you can always access your brushes by right-clicking with your stylus when the brush tool is active. So that's a quick overview. Play around with the workspace and find an arrangement that suits you. By the end of this course, it's my goal that you will have the confidence to paint any subject no matter how complex it might appear on the surface. In order to accomplish that, we must first begin with the study of the simplest and most fundamental objects. We will need to study a wide range of primitive forms, but let's first look at my favorite, the sphere, or ball if you prefer. When working with basic forms, I've always gravitated toward a sphere as a starting point. As I prepared for this course, I tried to understand why that might be. Perhaps it's because a ball is the most consistent of all primitive forms. It has no edges, no faces or sides, and no front, back, or top and bottom. It's the same no matter how you look at it. Only the light and shadow pattern will change on the sphere depending on the direction of the light source. And even then, it's far less variable than with other shapes. I find a lot of beauty in that, especially because despite being such a simple form, the sphere contains all the features of light and shadow found in nature, except for one, which we'll talk about later. There is great value in observing this consistent simplicity of the sphere, because it allows us to see clearly the character and play of light without added variables to confuse us. With this and other simple forms, we're able to isolate and clearly see the various dynamics of light and shadow in ways you simply can't do with more complex subjects. 
In order to paint believable scenes, we must first have a firm understanding of the nature of light. However, that's not the only benefit of studying these basic forms. The primitive shapes truly are the fundamental building blocks of all other objects. While working as a concept artist and illustrator, I spent years drawing a vast range of subject matter. It turns out, in order to paint cool things like castles, starships, fantasy characters and creatures effectively, it's a good idea to start by breaking them down into basic forms. You'll probably discover that when working from big to small and general to specific, the largest shapes tend to have the least complexity. The big shapes can often be simplified into these primitive forms. When you're able to really hone in on the essence of complicated forms, you'll see that it's basically just a lot of big simple shapes with smaller simple shapes attached to it. For example, the anatomy of the human body seems like one of the most complex subjects imaginable, or at least it does right up until you begin to break it down into the basic primitive forms. Towering castles might seem like imposing subjects, but in essence, they're really just towering stacks of simple building blocks. So my intention with the emphasis on this concept is to share my experience and hopefully to save you a few years of frustration. Perhaps you can already see the beauty of primitive forms because I can assure you that appreciation will pay off tremendously when you're faced with painting more complex subjects. In the absence of light, there are no shapes, no values, no colors, and certainly no textures or details. Perhaps something lingers there in the obscure depths, but we can't see it. Without light, we see nothing. But enough of this mystery. Let me turn on some ambient light. Suddenly, the shroud is gone. Even though it may be very dim, this light conveys to us a great deal of information about the scene. No doubt you can make out the general form of the object now, although its surface appears rather flat to us still. Ambient light feels very natural to our eyes. It's the general light that's being scattered and reflected throughout the environment. It's a soft, diffused light, much like what we experience on a cloudy day. Let me switch on a strong, direct light source. That really bumps up the drama and contrast, and we can clearly get a feel for the full volume of the sphere. And maybe just for fun, let me flip on a kick light too. There, the light is conveying a ton of information about the space and object now. As you can see, Light is necessary to convey any visual information. Every value, shape, color, and texture is shown to us through light reflecting off objects and entering our eyes. Therefore, in order to properly understand anything that we see and paint, we must first understand light. Throughout this course, I will constantly be referring to the various components of light and shadow. It's perhaps the most critical information to understand as a painter up front, because when we're painting, we're not actually painting objects. We're painting light that is reflecting off of objects. If you're interested, you should definitely study light from a scientific perspective. The physics behind it all is fascinating and a deeper understanding will lend you a greater confidence and command while painting. However, for now, it's enough to simply focus on the observable features of light that will be present in practically every rendering we create. As I mentioned earlier, the sphere is a wonderful starting point because with it we can clearly examine the anatomy of light and shadow. 
So let's use it as a model for the moment. We'll focus on the following essential components that you'll need to become very familiar with. First up is the form shadow. This is the shadowed side of an object. The direct light is blocked from reaching these faces, which are turned away from the light source. All solid objects will cast a shadow. These are projected onto other surfaces and tend to have sharp edges near the base of the object they're cast from. Cast shadows are a lot of fun to work with because they allow you to convey a great deal of information rather easily. Among other things, cast shadows clearly indicate the direction of the light source and help us understand the relative position of objects within a scene. Halftone describes the full range of tonal values observed within the lit region of an object. Depending on the material and local color of the object, halftones can be quite dark in value, but never as dark as regions in shadow. The darker region of a form shadow is known as the core of shadow. I will typically just refer to it as the core shadow. It's darker because these planes are facing away from reflected light that illuminates other regions of the shadow. The brightest region of the half tone where the light source hits the surface most directly can be referred to as the center light. These brightest half tones will appear on planes that face the light source most directly. We must be careful not to confuse this with specular highlights. Specular highlights are the mirror-like reflections of the light source. These reflections will sometimes be much brighter than the half tones of an object or sometimes barely distinguishable at all. These will tend to appear very sharp on smooth surfaces, but may be much softer on rough surfaces. Occlusion shadows, also known as ambient occlusion, appear anywhere light has trouble reaching, such as in tight corners or between crevices where forms come into contact. Of all the features of shadow, these are the most commonly overlooked by artists, while their effects may appear subtle, they go a long way towards making a scene feel more naturally lit. Reflected light provides the illumination that we see within shadows. On the sphere, you can see where the light from the ground plane is bouncing up into the shadows. If there were no reflected light or ambient light, the shadows would be completely dark. It's important that the value of reflected light in your shadows not become as bright as your half tones. This is a common mistake that will break the hierarchy of value in your image and the illusion of light with it. Often it's a good idea to downplay these reflections so that your shadows remain cohesive. The shadow line is technically called the terminator. You will typically see the most pronounced texture along this transition from light to shadow because the raking light makes uneven surfaces stand out dramatically against shadow. Lastly, the softening edge of a cast shadow is known as the penumbra. The further a cast shadow edge is from the base of the object casting it, the softer it will become as light and shadow mix. I know this might appear like a lot to remember, but with practice, I'm sure you'll find it very intuitive. Not all these elements are necessary to create great work because not every image demands to be fully rendered. The way you choose to include or ignore some of these features will largely determine your personal style. However, when you really want to push the illusion of luminosity within your paintings, these are the tools at your disposal. It's a great exercise to practice identifying these features of light and shadow in various environments. While the world is certainly full of complexity that can often make these components more challenging to discern, light, thankfully, is quite predictable. This is great because it means that once we become intimately familiar with the character of light in a wide range of scenarios, we will be able to apply that knowledge to our creative work. If we want to, we'll be able to invent entire scenes from our imagination and illuminate it with convincing light and shadow.